I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it from here, folks. Uh, <laughs> happy coffee buzz, everybody. Cheers. 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 Noel, cheers. Well, those are our three worst mugs, too. So we know These, I got an elephant mug. Here. Who gave you this, Steve? That's actually Nikki's. Nikki's? We're not on. No, we're <laughs> we're rolling. Oh, we are on. Yeah, that's actually Nikki's. Yeah, no, your voice just sound, it sounds good in it, doesn't it? Yeah, I kind of we kind of sound a little choppy. So that's Nikki's cup. What's that one? That's Kent's cup. Mine's a coffee mug that says coffee. Yeah, this is uh, just our bottom of the barrel coffee mugs today. For anyone who sees the clip, uh, we got a snowman. That's kind of. I think Andy's Bush League mug. Mm-hmm. Uh, the elephant is Nikki's, but it's just not practical. Right. And Pete's is just your everyday Bush League coffee mug. There's not a lot of flair here today. Um, hopefully, we can make up for it with our answers. Yeah, 100%. That was bought at a truck stop. That was bought <laughs> at a dollar store. And this was bought out of uh, good intentions. That might have been made at a fax class. Yep. <laughs> Very well. Here we go. Nolly, you can gather it up now. <laughs> gather it up. Here we go. What is the first secret you've ever kept from somebody? What is the first secret you ever kept from somebody? It had to be breaking something at the house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You you think about it in terms of, do um, you remember when you were young and you got blatantly like red-handed caught and you just blatantly... Openly didn't admit it back. Yeah, it was me. <laughs> Not me. Mm-mm. Harvey, mm-hmm. I just watched you smash that window. Yeah. No, I didn't. Yeah, that was my brother. <laughs> that was Kevin. What do you think about that? A lie. Yeah, a lie. That you were the first lie you ever told to somebody? Yeah. Did it ever get found out? Just the first time you like kept a secret from somebody. Hmm. I would have to imagine that universally that's gotta be pretty common that you didn't tell the first girl you liked her. That's what I was thinking of too, because I grew I grew up with three sisters. Mm. So, and I was a baby, so, like, I wasn't, I was telling on them all the time. Right. Very transparent. Right. My sister Jenny broke my collarbone, pushed me over a vacuum, told on her right away. (laughs) Uh, My dad didn't believe me, told me that I was fine, drove up to the cabin. Three days later, not the cabin. We didn't have a cabin. It just sounded cool to say that. We drove up to a cabin we rented for the weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um... I was crying again, so my mom got so mad at my dad. We went to a local doctor. He said, yeah, it's a broken collarbone. So that's uh, a really big tangent, but it's a heck of a fun story, huh, Nolan? That's mm-hmm. a painful injury, too, for a kid to sustain and then just, just ride up to the cabin. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're talking to a guy who lacerated his kidney and put a bag of peas on it, Pete. And that was, uh, <laughs> that was winning that race against that girl you liked. Kylie Stang beat Kylie Stang in an inflatable obstacle course race at age 12. Dove too far over the end. As history goes, mm-hmm. lacerated my kidney, mm-hmm. put a pack of peas on it because I wanted to play in my Kent Herbeck field ball tournament the next weekend. <laughs> I got to stop it real short. So that's my lie. Yeah. I told my dad I was fine. There we go. There I got one. I told my dad I was fine. I was said that was your dad's first lie. <laughs> so that was the first lie of your life. That's what I can remember is I, I, I my dad would always – Say something like, I don't do anything stupid tonight. Did yeah, you guys' yeah, dad say yeah. that to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so so I lacerated my kidney. So my answer was to ice it. Turns out I only have one. Got home and started violently puking, and then oh. he figured out that I had done something, something stupid. Something bad happened. Yeah, yeah because luck. you're too, yeah, because you're really young there. It's funny you said the dad, don't do anything stupid. My mom used to tickle me all the time when I was a little boy, right? And she'd always, like, you know, come get me and do all that stuff, and then my sister would try to do it too, and then... Whenever they would get me, I was really small growing up, and they would pin me down, you know? And it was just like my old sister would try to do that, and I could always hear my dad in the background going, not his pitching arm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stay off his pitching arm. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Hey, this is really bothering me, though. I can't get it out of my head. We forgot to turn off the, the laundry. Can you rip that off real quick? Just real quick. Oh, I'm going to need that tomorrow. Because I can't stop hearing it. And it started stopping my train of thought. It's relaxing me. The laundry? I didn't didn't even notice it. I went home to do my laundry today because you said you were going to go do your laundry. Another big lie I used to tell was a big problem at my house was we would always leave the towels on the floor in the bathroom. Oh, boy. And every time I left the towel on the floor, whose towel is this? I'd be like, not mine. (laughs) Certainly not mine. I think I saw Jenny in there. I went to Jenny a lot on stuff. She got. She I got, should call her. Yeah, you should. Call, you should go see her. You should go see her this week. <laughs> what do you got, Pete? What got do you got, here? All American? You yeah. never made a lie over yeah, there, Mr. Mr. Northwestern. Lied Mr. All the time. Perfect. Lied all the time. 
Uh, so one of my big lies growing up, not a great example setter, but I used to make my own books, like make up my own book reports. I'd create the book, create the author. This was uh, junior high when we were together, seventh grade. I used to make my own books for book reports. That was probably, That's probably why we didn't hang out much. Lines, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you made up a book and then wrote Mul- a book report? Multiple times on it. Multiple times. And, I think uh, I did that too. I did yeah, something how similar would they ever to that. Know? I did something yeah. similar. I used it's to always do. Genius. I used to yeah. always do holes. I used to write a book report on holes for like ten <laughs> years. <laughs> you guys remember that the holes? Uh, at what is it, Mrs. Cerrone? Yeah, Hector Cerrone. Hector Cerrone. So I, I guess go get it. I guess that would. I'm going to go with the uh, the book. Re- no, nah, I don't want to take your book report, but I'll go with holes because then I would never read the book holes again in high, in school, and I'd always tell the teacher I read the book holes. Book report on holes, fake books, towels on the floor. Yeah, there it is. Simple. Quick follow up. Can you lie without saying a word? Yes. Yes. Yes, more so because of Steve's confidence led me to yes. believe that that's a strong yes. Well, if you like, if you knew that you were, let's say you're in a relationship and you're in an argument and they say something like, Were you home at that time? You could go, yeah. yeah. Or hey, did, hey, did you reme- do you do you remember our anniversary? Those shrugs, like, yeah. <laughs> or you could do thumbs up. You could do thumbs up or hey, thumbs down. Are you mad at me? Oh. <laughs> Who left the towels on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. No, yeah. So, yeah, then I guess now you convinced me out of your confidence. Never the smartest person at the table. It's the most confident. And then you guys had great examples. That's really good. Hopefully people watch the clip. Really good body language. (laughs) (laughs) When you worry about something, what are you choosing not to see? When you worry about something, what do you – is this question two? Yep, it's question two. So that wasn't – that was a side question. just question two. This sounds like a real good Harvey question. Yeah. Say it one more time. When you worry about something, what are you choosing not to see? Seems right up your alley, It's a fu- future versus present scenario. This is your wheelhouse. <laughs> this is a layup for me, isn't yes. it? Yeah, it's a layup. Go ahead and start the clock at 72 minutes. Well, I would ha- I'd, have to start, I'd have to start with um, one of the main reasons. I think one of the main ways to find an answer or have awareness is asking yourself the question. So you'd have to say, well, what am I worrying about to begin with? And then what is worry... Uh, basically a result of it's a result of a future because you can't really unless an immediate past just happened that you know is about to be come out so if you tell a lie and you know it will come out at some point it's still in the future right so it already happened so i always say it's fake time in the past now so you can't really worry about the past because it's not actually relevant but you can worry about uh, what would happen in the future so i could be worried about getting recruited when in reality you truly have no control over what someone thinks about you um or you have no wor- you have no control over the stimulus you could go you could be super pumped for a showcase in a month and then it just gets rained out <laughs> you know you could just have that something could happen like that so that was my first thought yeah i it just distracts from the present. Yeah. I, I spend a lot of time worrying for a certain scenario. Like mo- most of it obviously is sports related, like interviews and those kind of things. And then what, like once you get there and once you go through the routines and that kind of thing, that stuff goes away as I mean, just experience limits worry down the road for me or it has for me. But what's a, uh, we were talking about it not too long ago where like that's why it's so hard to be present Mm -hmm. because if you're worrying or anticipating you're in the future if you're remembering or telling stories you're in the past so Mm -hmm. it's so hard to control the present talk in your mind and be productive without escaping to the future or returning to the past do you think that the present is okay this question for us do you think that the present is achievable in the mind because you can't argue the present in the body. Your body is never in the future, in the past. Like yeah. it truly is just in the present. But then the body's the unconscious mind. So consciously, in your brain, can you ever achieve presence? I really don't think so. Because just when, like, even if you're thinking about, <laughs> yeah, you, come at me, bro. But body like, language, but <laughs> confident body language. But like, I just. <laughs> There's a, no matter what you're thinking about, you can think about what you're currently doing. Like there's like times where like you get a flow state. I say that's being present. Like 
Mm-hmm. Like when you get like when you're working or you're reading or you're cleaning or something, you're present, but you're still absorbing something for the past or to prepare you for the future. So that's where I get kind of caught up. And I think outside of that split moment where you're in the moment or in the flow state, everything else is you're remembering and applying, but it's not present. So let's say you're seventy percent. Let's say you're more present than you are thinking about the future. Would you consider that being present? You mean like in that flow state? Yeah. Yeah. Like I'd agree with that being present, but it, it just, it's that flowing state. Like you're, you're here, but as you accomplish or whatever you are in that flow state, you have to remember back to it to apply it. So could you, could you ever truly enjoy if you were never present? Because then if you didn't, if the word enjoy, there would, you would be nostalgic. Mm-hmm. There would be yeah. never any actual enjoyment because enjoyment is in the present you're enjoying what you're doing yes so that'd be a fake word no no i i understand what you're saying and i think we hang our hat a lot on nostalgia because we remember being happy and we try and replicate it but i guess yeah enjoyment's the present version of it and but like it's crazy how quick it flips to like like one you'll forget it or two how we always drive home like hey remember this moment remember this feeling remember this enjoyment and that's why we chase that. But I just, yeah, I get, I just, it's just so quick. The present's so fucking quick. I think being present is kind of like having a good round of golf, right? Never happens, but when it happens, you're like, oh my god, I'm having a good round. This of is golf. awesome. Wouldn't that be the flow state? Yeah, that would be. But I, what I'm saying is, is I, I know what you're saying. Like technically, you're never gonna just be on one thing. But I think you can be mainly present. And I just think it's few and far between. I think that that the key word there is mainly present. Yeah. Because I've always I've always looked at it as you're in the you are always in the immediate future, like everything is a is in the future. Whereas what I say is that is I'm saying a sentence, but if I say Hey Steve, what's going on? By the time I said Hey, I'm already predicting what's going on, so I'm already in the future. Like I'm already. As you speak, I'm already getting ready to respond. So I could take a moment and pause, but I'm only pausing for what I'm about to say. So I'm just always just that. I don't know if that's in terms of seconds or milliseconds or whatever, if you want to use time to quantify that. But I would look at that as life in your mind is always happening like a split ahead of the present. And so even when you have those moments where you're nostalgic or you're in the flow state, a lot of times, a lot of people report saying things similar to, well, oh, this is going to end, you know, yeah. or take this in right now, you know, but it's okay. If I say take this in right now, by the time the hang with me here, by the time I said, take this in with me right now, when I thought about that moment, I spoke it into existence and now I'm speaking about something I just thought about in the past. But that's why I'm saying how quick and qu- yeah. quick the present is, but like it's a... It's a present to a flow state, I think, is what we chase most often. Even like when we're sitting and having like a deep conversation or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Or again, you're again doing something you're passionate about and you're just flowing through it. Like like a good golf game or a workout or a game. Like like when I'm like when I know I'm in like a good headspace, I'm just like on to the next, on to the next, like and I'm a- a- approaching it in just that near near future and i know i can't control the past like that's that's what i chase yeah i think that the present is understood in your basically in the chemistry between your mind and your body when you are because there's a lot of things where um where you could be physiologically nervous you know and you could be talking yourself out of that like you could get up for a game and Really, if you think about in a, if you play in an NFL football game, like the first thing that you actually acknowledge is the nerves of your body, and then you start creating a story off of that. And one of the the high performers is going to create an exciting story off of that, compared to maybe the rookie who doesn't make it through the first week of camp because he's nervous. You know, so it's basically your nervous system makes like the first call through the present for sure I agree. and then you make and then the flow state so then what is the flow state because it still is like a story so is the story isn't that wouldn't that be the essence of mind body and spirit connection like it's all in alignment 
Yeah, I'd agree. Even if it ends up being negative or positive, it's still that's still gonna leave that weight behind it. Yeah, and, and like even as a pro, like you you have those games where like you get your ass kicked. You should, where you get <laughs> swore on it. Put a disclaimer. Hey, Pete, on let it. me give you an example. <laughs> swearing and then swearing about swearing isn't the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> You're not present, bro. <laughs> oh man, that was funny. Um, <laughs> oh man, I was just present right there. Oh, yeah, you man. were, man. We were present. Hey, remember laughing. this. Remember this. Remember <laughs> this. Remember, <laughs> this. Remember, <laughs> this. Remember, remember that time. Remember that time we laughed. <laughs> <laughs> but like, if you have that, if you get whooped on the first play. And you can have that narrative in the present to say, "All right, let's ride." Like that's that's not happening again. Like, mm-hmm. and that's a mixture of pride and presence and all the, those things. Or you can let it destroy you, and that first play ruins the rest of your game and ruins the rest of your present. Yeah. So <clears throat> that would be it, the essence of yeah. coaching presence. Yeah, which to is get a, to that point. healthy little balance. And I mean, at like every single sport, I'm pretty sure a coach says, "Flush the last play, good or bad," to to some extent. Yeah. Olympians, baseball players, football players, anything. So, again, that's just coaching the control of presence and controlling that immediate future. But, again, like when you're when you're thinking about the future and you're thinking about the next batter that's coming up, you're understanding what your pitch you're going to throw. I'm assuming something along those lines where, again, you're in the present again. You're worrying or you're preparing. Yeah. I mean, we, in the past, for question two, we went way over our five minute. Yeah. And I think we flush it. And uh, I think we move on. On to the next play. It's a great point. Great points. The fact that you didn't use the Rafiki quote in that whole thing is crazy to me. Either run from it or learn from it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just have a little back problem here yeah. midway through the, the coffee see. buzz. <laughs> what is the nicest thing someone has ever done for you? What is the nicest thing someone's ever done for you, Steve? Um, you want to get brownie points? <laughs> <You're gonna laughs> oh, Kelsey made me a lunch today. And it was, uh, I uh, wow, that's a great question, Nolan. Because the reason I love doing coffee buzzes is, is when you ask questions like that. Because now inherently, I have to think about things that mm-hmm. are good and like people have done for me. I immediately thought of my sister Kelly. Oh boy. But, the problem there is that she does so many good things mm. that I can't like pinpoint one. See, and that's why I've avoided that type of stuff for so long. Yeah, Mart, what we should do is we should have you say the one thing that maybe you think someone's done nice for you and then come back to me because I've had a lot of good stuff happen. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. The point is basically, and if you only do maybe a few nice things for people, if it's really nice, I mean, you grab yourself. You can grab yourself off human emotion nowadays. I don't know, three, four years. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the nicest. The nicest thing that anyone's ever done for me was my, recently uh, my 30th birthday. I got that book of, uh, of stories that uh, a bunch of my buds wrote. Co- former coaches wrote in it. Family members wrote in it. And everyone wrote their favorite Martin story. Some of them uh, some of them made me cry. Some of them made me laugh extremely loud and hard, and it was hilarious. And uh, some were kind of like, yeah, you could have done a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine was five words. <laughs> yeah, there, there were a few. There were a few where I, I went, uh, well, I won't call him as much as I used to. No, 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 I'm just kidding. But that was probably the nicest thing people did for me was uh, people from all across the country wrote me a book of stories for my 30th birthday. So I read that at 2 a.m. And I'll let it. I'll let it sit right there. And I'm I'm done for question three. But you guys, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Pete. Do you have anything sticking out? I've had a lot of really good people that I've the, come in contact with my whole life. Yeah, the amount of support my parents have had for me through kind of the ups and downs of sports have been absolutely incredible. My dad um, took a job where he's traveling all the time and still made it back to some high school games. Or my mom just recently sent me a folder of pictures from when I put like. Uh, my mom and my brother flew out to Des Moines, Iowa to see me play an arena football game. I was only there for four weeks. They, sh- they flew out for that. Um, just just those sacrifices. And then, yeah, they just they allowed us to live our lives. So I, the only thing I think of is my parents. They've given up so much for me. But, um, 
Yeah, that's, how, yeah, that's and how our it, parents yeah. too, Mart. Let's in case our parents are listening, yeah. let's not have them hate us. Yeah, no, they've done. They've done. The, I mean, I would have to imagine all of our parents. That's what probably why yeah. we're on coffee buzzes, right? We yeah. got stories like that. The yeah. cool thing for Pete is his parents had an opportunity to do that much longer than ours. Sorry yeah, they about did. that. I mean, do you remember? Yeah, I wish I would have practiced. <laughs> remember, we were more. playing in that national championship <laughs> game. Remember, we were playing in that national championship game. Yep. And my parents surprised me and flew in for that. Yeah. I mean, they hadn't seen me. My dad hadn't seen me play ball in like three years or something like that. And he was just, gonna make it. Yeah, and they just flew in. They were just there. Like I remember at BP, and they walked in. I was like, "No way!" <laughs> you know, what I mean? and, and I got the final out of that game, and you caught it, national champs, two thousand ten. But <laughs> and then that was a way to give the gift back to them. <laughs> you know, you're welcome. You're welcome, mom. Where are you? Where are you keep going, Pete? I feel like you're diving I, in more. I think I that's just, really cool. I, I, I would, like I've had just a lot of random people. Like my doctor has been like opened his doors to his house and his family for me. And like when I got my jaw broke, like went out of his way to drag me to his house and te- like just teach me how to supplement, how to get past this valley that I was in at the time, both mentally and physically. And I actually got stronger through the scenario. So I just pe- people like that. Like I I always tell Harv, help and support are not yours to keep. Like people help you and support you, so you got to give back. So these nice things that people have done for us, we have to return the favor, and mm-hmm. it has to keep going round and round because that's, I think, what makes us so good at what we're at is the help and support we've got. So, you know, what would be that. interesting is taking like a year and a half or two years, however long it takes, and actually think about that question and make a book of it mm. and just write down. It's a great a short story, all the nice things that people have done for you. And at the end of it, kind of like tied into like the lesson that you learned from it. Because with the amount of people who have helped me or done nice things for me, like I could for sure write a book about it. Yeah, yeah. you'd have to really, you'd have to, that'll be a question that we'll remember on our own today. And for, like, if you ask yourself that oh, question. Anytime I'm driving in the next week yeah, you're just by like, myself, oh, wow, I'll probably think about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think about, think about I stayed people... in, in Matt Serna's parents' house for free. Right. They wouldn't let me pay rent when I was 23 years old. They made me all my meals. Matt got me a job. You know, Tom offered me a job. Um, I mean, my parents, same thing. I think about my buddies driving out to Eau Claire to watch me play. I think about my high school coaches doing that type of stuff. Like, I mean, you can sit in there and you can do it. But I think that ultimately, for anyone that's listening, like, if you don't have people – if you sit there and you actually really think about it and you don't have more than one, like that's, you got to start figuring out yourself priorities. Yeah. Because in order to get that kind of stuff, you have to affect people. Mm-hmm. People aren't just giving that out. Like you have to change people's lives. You have to affect them positively for you to get positivity back. Like that's a real thing. Yeah. And they have to feel yeah. it on you. And it, but yeah, if you, like realize the recency of it too like you should be able to trace it back from this week to like when you're a kid i was just going through that whole gauntlet of time where like in like in la like logan and kimmy and caroline opening their doors to us and then going back i remember like the my first day in pickerington ohio the kid like nobody let me sit with them on the bus but this (laughs) this kid brian mcdonald says yeah you can sit here i'm like remember that forever yeah so it's just crazy things like that like you should have that gauntlet in your life or have that inventory of support and understand who you need to support i think when you when you realize that too going through that it's kind of crazy how you say how you got that that help and stuff because that was a lot of what i mean we were all a part of my weirdest time was when i got released and i was super broke and yeah didn't know what to do and pete was just you just signed with the vikings and we didn't you didn't know what you were gonna do <laughs> and basically steve housed me for a year and a half and basically two took, and a half yeah a long time it was a long time <laughs> bunk, bunk buddies yeah i didn't have to pay rent for a really long time the people were buying me groceries uh i had my buddies from michigan would fly out here remember they'd put oh. their their checks in them. yeah you want to talk about next question is nolan should be what moment were you most nervous about <laughs> <laughs> My answer would segue right from Harvey's Michigan buddies flying in. Great, unbelievable guys. Great dudes. Do it for you. Do ha- Luke just you. got married last weekend. I felt I almost felt weird not being there, and I've only met the guy twice. <laughs> we FaceTimed you. Yeah, we, we FaceTimed face you. Time. We FaceTimed you. <laughs> FaceTime me too. Yeah, the coolest, the coolest story, the coolest story we got out of that though was I remember 
uh, that was a weird time for a lot of people, and, and mostly me, right? And then we were MASH was starting. We started MindStrong, kind of doing all those seminars. That was in 2015. Remember I showed you those pictures today? Yeah. So Steve and I would uh, speak at these MindStrong seminars. We did it for like two, two or three years or so. We just would give these free seminars, and then uh, – they like remember the one got big we had to go to that high school so then uh, your high school at valley and then we we're like oh, oh eagles they were like all right well, maybe we should try to start doing this <laughs> you know so but i remember when uh paul came out here and we went up camping and that was the first time it ever hit me that you could that your friends didn't care if you were like broke or if you didn't make it in the big leagues like your people who loved you like they didn't care like your doctor he didn't care that okay this guy needs help you know what i mean like i gotta help him do this or this person serena goes no man he needs a place to stay so people like never really care and that the coolest lesson i got of that the people who love you don't they don't see you for what you externally achieve so they feel that love off you and then they give it back to you and once you like realize that you build that support system now there's a huge part of it and you guys have both talked about it you have to give that to people so you have to be an unbelievable value adder to your tribe. But then your tribe, once you're in, like you're in. So then once you understand that you have this awesome tribe of growth, like it's the most comforting feeling to take a chance on yourself. Because you're just like, I can do whatever that I, can, that I want to do. And I can do it with the people that I love and they love me. And then I can help them too. And then you just have this like, um, I don't know, it's like sort of like an ecosystem of like trust because stuff's going to suck along the way of tackling any dream we all know that right but if you have this like rock bottom that is strong full of love trust uh, family friends as you get older you go well then hell i'll take a shot on my dream because at the end of the day i'm having dinner with my buddies and the line that we had back in the day what was i was with paul and we were up at, we were up at an island and i looked at paul and i go this ain't so bad man and he goes yeah you'll be all right you'll get out of it I go, yeah, I mean, we could just go fishing, you know? And Paul goes, yeah, man, if we never make our dreams come true, we'll just go fishing, but let's try at least. And then a few years later, McGuigan uh, tells me at the house, like, hey, we, you know, we're going to make enough money where you can go get your own place now. You know, we've got careers. We can start living a little bit. And then the next year, uh, we got this huge facility that we're, that we're now in, and people see all those pictures and whatnot. But we're in this facility, dude. So it's 20,000 square foot. There's nothing in there. It's concrete, everything. There's not one thing in the facility. And Steve's doing, now I see my buddy go. Got a little real on me there. Yeah, I see my buddy <laughs> going like, uh, is this going to work? Because <laughs> we got to fill, right? fill this thing. And I just remember, remember we were in that back corner. Oh, we, yeah. made, we made light of it. And I looked at Steve. I said, well, if it doesn't work out, we'll just go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, that was sweet. This is going to be a long buzz. Yeah. Long buzz. Well, we missed last week. Yeah, it, our buzz. Yeah, our buzz. All right. So if aliens came to Earth and you were in charge of picking the first person to greet them, who would you choose and why? Okay, so let me start with this Obviously hardcore. Obviously, don't say me. Just let me start with this. Let me start with this. Let me start with this hardcore because feeding off of the last question, we were at a, I was at a wedding last week and one of my former college teammates. And at the end of the night, we end up, we do our final celebrating. So the reception ends. We're going to go out and, we're, and we didn't want the night to end, right? We don't see each other that much. Stogie time. Yeah, stogie yeah. time. We're going to sit. We're going to kick back and relax. And we didn't want the night to end. And when you're with your college roommates, as you guys know, similar to us too, but you just go down the rabbit holes of mm. conversations. You just go into stuff. Aliens came up. <laughs> so aliens come up. We're talking about aliens. And I, I don't remember what happened or whatnot. And as we're having a conversation, a guy, I can feel a guy on my back shoulder. And, hate that feeling. And my buddy... Nixon's not no longer looking at me. He's looking at what's above my back shoulder. But we're with all our college roommates and teammates. So I'm thinking, like, it would be funny, you know what I mean, if somebody, like, he would make some sort of pass. He wouldn't just be staring at this person over my shoulder. And out of nowhere, I'm now not sure if I should look over my shoulder. And then I was very unsure to look over my shoulder when this voice chimes in and says, boys, aliens are real. 
<laughs> and then, and then, uh, then I went up and went to the bathroom. And, Who and was I, it? I don't know. We didn't know the guy. <laughs> we didn't know the guy. We didn't know the guy. I said, I got to go to the bathroom. Got to the bathroom, texted Nixon and said, uh, meet me on the road. But I'm walking home. <laughs> so it's August 1st, 2019, and my sources are a 16-year-old kid. But apparently, <laughs> apparently, we almost got smoked by a comet last night. Did you guys hear this? I don't know. Anyone listening to this, that is my source. But he told me that we almost got hit by a comet, and Nate Stemper, strength coach at MASH Performance, went on a a three-and-a-half-minute explanation of how the dinosaurs went extinct, (laughs) and it was unbelievable. I'm just thinking of space right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he told me, once again, now my source is Nate Stemper, that the Gulf Gulf of Mexico is the crater – from the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. What? <laughs> That's an interesting fact. What? We're going to look that up. And that yeah, there's, that, but- it blew up so much that there's a certain layer of the earth that you have to dig to that no fossil has ever been found above that layer. And so basically the earth was like coated like- in a new layer. <laughs> Because wow. this thing hit. Kicked up so much dirt. Yeah, whatever. dude. I don't know anything I'm talking about, but that's what people have told me <laughs> well, in the last 24 us. hours. Well, you're I was, freaking us I out. was terrified the whole day, Mark. I was terrified. Mark came out and he said, where are you going, Steve? I was walking outside just to think about that's it. That's why you went outside. <laughs> yeah, I was like, dude, we almost got hit by a comet. The Gulf of Mexico is from an asteroid. Like, I'm freaking out. I anytime any sun. Anytime any man can't stop to say hello to you, and I got to get some sun, you go, something happened. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I was thinking about it. <laughs> something happened back there. I was thinking about it. <laughs> A lot. Well, like, uh, just listen to some of those Rogan podcasts where the guys get on there talking about, like, astrology and, like, the different times when asteroids could have hit and smaller asteroids could have hit and caused, like, the end of a certain ice age and all this kind of stuff. But they talk along those lines that, like, this might be, like, when the window is, but every year we pass through, like, this orbit where we're, like, go through, like, one of the asteroid belts. And we always have, every year between, I think it's, like, end of july and end of october or november we pass through and then you have a chance to get like that's how they think the world's gonna end again hmm. golly dude and, and these are like scientists that these are smart yes, guys very smart mm-hmm. guys mm-hmm. so all of this has led to my answer for who i would send to talk to the <laughs> aliens and I'm, I'm a little embarrassed because you'd think you'd know this guy's name starting roadhouse moved his way on if anyone's seen a star is born Ooh, Bradley nice. Cooper's brother, yep, who currently stars in The Ranch. Great show. That guy. The older gentleman? The, oh, yeah. Great Bo, looking Bo, Bo guy. Be, Bo Bennett on The Ranch. I'm blanking on his name. Great looking guy. Uh, Unbelievable Sam voice. Sam something. Tough, yeah. but listens. Hmm. In Roadhouse, he was a, he was a uh, cooler. Vet bouncer. Yeah, cooler. he was a vet yeah. bouncer, a cooler. He used to call people amigo. Mm. He's got some coolness on him. Yeah, but he's also cool. a tough guy. He's got an unbelievable mustache. He's the guy, Mart, so you should know this now if you're an actual big Lebowski fan. Mm-hmm. He's the guy who narrates. Sam Elliott. He says the dude. Mm. What's his name? Sam Elliott. If you don't want Sam Elliott representing the human race, I don't know who you're sending. That's Fair enough. I, I, was said, I said Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger. I just, watched, boy. Uh, I just watched a documentary with him the other day. Uh, I would go with, uh, and I think this is a, f- a great way to end it, and uh, I'd go with the guy off uh, Independence Day who told everybody the aliens were real <laughs> and no one wanted to listen to him. And at the end of the movie, he's riding right up into the mothership going, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> the guy from Vegas Vacation. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend, folks. <laughs> Cheers.